and Kate Snow in for Tom Yamas tonight. We begin again with the war in Ukraine, stretching into a 20th day, Russia relentlessly bombarding civilian targets, smoke still billowing from apartment windows as the sun rose over Kyiv, Russian airstrikes killing at least four people across that city, the mayor telling people not to leave home for 35 hours starting tonight. In the northeast, Russian shelling reducing cities to rubble, drone footage released by the Ukrainian military revealing the extent of the damage Russian attacks crippling the region's power grid, heat and water supplies. And in Kharkiv, Ukraine, shell-shocked residents rescued from their bombed-out homes, only to be sent running for cover again as Russian jets flew overhead. Still, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky remains defiant. His impassioned speech to the Canadian Parliament receiving a three-minute standing ovation. The leader again asking for a no-fly zone over Ukraine as he prepares to address the U.S. Congress tomorrow. President Biden now planning his trip to Europe next week for a NATO summit. The stakes of that meeting incredibly high as the situation in Kyiv grows more dire by the day. Richard Engel leads our coverage again from the capital city tonight. In wars, front lines are never clear. But now Ukrainians are being targeted just for being in their homes. Russia shelled a building in the city of Kharkiv, burning the apartments of people trying to ride out the war. Russia attacked another apartment block in Kyiv, killing four. And this is what's left of a subway station here. But while Russia is breaking buildings, the will to fight and pull together remains strong. This is one of Kyiv's main subway stations, and you can't get more central than this. In some ways, it shows that Russia is expanding its military reach, hitting right into the heart of Kyiv. But it's also a sign of weakness because Russia's front lines, its tanks and armored vehicles, haven't been advancing. So instead, Russia is relying on its long-range weapons, its rockets and artillery to carry out attacks like this, which are generally unguided and just hit civilians. Upstairs, the station is ruined. But down below, Ukrainians are hiding from Russian attacks. In a parked subway car that's been her home for more than a week, Tanya heard the blast up above. Why do you think Russia's doing this? Attacking the center of the city, attacking the people where the places where people are trying to hide from the bombings. So that they can take some land from us, she says. They've already destroyed so much in Kharkiv and areas of Kyiv. It's like they don't have enough. They want more. In the corridor is Alina, her family, and three-year-old daughter, Anna. We're scared because no matter where you are hiding, the danger can follow you. Today, Ukraine's President Zelensky, who sharply criticized President Biden and NATO for not doing more to help Ukraine, accused the West of being hypnotized by Russian aggression, too worried about how President Putin will react, and making an impassioned plea to Canadian lawmakers for a no-fly zone. Can you imagine that? Cruise missiles are being falling down on your tearing and your children are asking you what happened he got a three minute standing ovation but russians never hear that message until last night when a producer rushed on the set of russia's main newscast with a sign that said no war and don't believe the propaganda the journalist was detained and given a small fine but could face harsher penalties she spoke outside court today. Was my own anti -war decision. Other journalists are being silenced forever. Fox News announcing the death of cameraman Pierre Krzyzewski, a veteran of conflict zones, killed in the same attack that seriously wounded correspondent Benjamin Hall. A Ukrainian producer and translator working with the team, Oleksandra Kushinova, was also killed. She was 24 years old. Kate, with ceasefire talks ongoing, and the negotiators aren't releasing many details about them. President Zelensky today suggested what could be a major concession, saying Ukraine could accept security guarantees in lieu of NATO membership, which Russia strongly opposes. Richard, thank you so much for all of your reporting over there. Next, this war's refugee crisis growing rapidly and now passing another milestone. More than three million refugees have now fled Ukraine, about half of them children. That's almost one every second. Gabe Gutierrez has the latest from Ukraine. Tonight, holding her two young daughters and nephew, Hannah Selenko is racing from her home in eastern Ukraine. 
arriving in Lviv, her emotions caught up with her. I'm fleeing for the sake of my children, she tells us. UNICEF now says one and a half million children have been forced to leave Ukraine. That's around 55 children every minute of the war, or almost one every second. Today, from the Netherlands to Belgium to France, where President Macron comforted refugees, more of Europe felt the strain of the growing crisis. In Italy, school children welcome displaced Ukrainian students, while in Poland, Warsaw's mayor says 300,000 refugees have fled to his city in just two weeks. He's calling on the UN and the European Union to come up with a better plan. We cannot do it forever. We cannot improvise anymore. We just need help. Today, as we traveled into Ukraine, we met Zoriana Prosenko at the Hungarian border, reuniting with friends and family. She'd left her home near Kyiv with her two young children weeks ago. No, I'm just numb, she tells us. We had no intention of being refugees. Like her, so many now don't know when or if they'll return. The uncertainty here is crushing. I must save my family. This is first. Konsta and his wife Elisa are frantically trying to reach Poland after their town in eastern Ukraine was bombed. Among their baby's first words, she's 10 months old and already knows war too well. Gabe Gutierrez joins me now from Lviv, Ukraine. Gabe, I have to ask, you just arrived in Ukraine today. You've been all over the world. You cover all kinds of stories. What's your reaction to seeing the scope of the devastation, what the refugees are facing? Uh, hi there, Kate. Well, we just drove in from Hungary. It was a uh, many hours long drive where we took a roundabout way to get into Ukraine because the border crossing into Poland is just so packed. This one was not as full, and there were several checkpoints on the way to Lviv. Now, this city, Lviv, saw at least three air raid sirens today, including one as we drove in. But what struck me was that this city remains remarkably calm, a far cry from other parts of the country to the east and south. But, Kate, those refugees, it is so difficult to hear their stories of trauma. It really is incredible to fathom. And the toughest part for many of them is that there is really no end in sight here. Kate. I'm sure, Gabe. Thanks for being there. And tonight we're learning that President Biden will attend a NATO summit in Brussels next week. The White House announcing he will be traveling to discuss the Russian invasion of Ukraine with America's allies. NBC Chief White House correspondent Kristen Welker joins me now from the White House. Kristen, what's the goal of the trip? Well, Kate, President Biden will attend that high-stakes summit with 30 NATO leaders next Thursday. And a key goal will be to showcase the U.S. and its allies' unified opposition to Vladimir Putin's invasion. But the pressure on President Biden to do more to help Ukraine will likely intensify tomorrow when Ukraine's President Zelensky addresses Congress virtually. Now, Zelensky is expected to again plead with lawmakers for a no-fly zone and for those military jets that Poland wants to give Ukraine. But President Biden Biden has opposed both, saying those moves could cause World War III. A no-fly zone is not widely supported in Congress, as you know, but there is growing bipartisan support for giving Ukraine those Polish fighter jets. The White House today saying the president still opposes it and that he'll give his own speech tomorrow after Zelensky, Kate. And going back to the trip again, uh, do we know anything else about whether the president, President Biden, might meet with Ukrainian President Zelensky or refugees displaced from the crisis? That's the big question. We press White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki on both of those questions. Would the president meet with Zelensky or refugees? She didn't rule out either option, Kate, but it seems like they're still working through key details and whether that's even possible. Now, one other key point, in order for the trip to be considered a success, the president and his European allies really need to announce something. They need to announce more support for Ukraine in some form or fashion. And at this point, Kate, it's unclear if they'll be able to do so. Kate. All right, Kristen, thank you. And now to an NBC News exclusive with Russian attacks that have targeted nuclear power plants. We're going behind closed doors tonight to the headquarters responsible for monitoring the nuclear danger in Ukraine. NBC's Josh Letterman takes us inside. With war raging in Ukraine, the world has watched as its major nuclear sites have been caught in the crosshairs of battle. Critical sensors at Chernobyl have gone silent after Russia's military shelled the site of Europe's biggest nuclear disaster and took it over, temporarily knocking out the power. Just one in a string of harrowing incidents in Russia's war in Ukraine, raising fears of nuclear catastrophe. Another nuclear plant, Zaporizhia, also coming under Russian attack, 
part of it catching fire. The fact that there may be a running operation doesn't mean that things are fine. This is the inside of what nuclear experts call the ready room. From this nerve center in Vienna, the United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, is closely watching all 15 of Ukraine's nuclear reactors. Tell us about what we're seeing on the screen here. In the middle of the screen, you're seeing real-time radiological monitoring data being delivered to the IAEA directly from Ukraine, from Ukrainian sources. And in some cases, some of that monitoring data that we used to receive is no longer arriving. So far, crisis averted. But the IAEA's Director General, Rafael Mariano Grossi, says next time the world might not be so lucky. The scenario that is keeping me up is the possibility of an attack or a uh, an episode where wittingly or unwittingly there could be an, a direct impact to any of the of the facilities when you are in an armed conflict an active armed conflict these things can happen anytime and at chernobyl ukrainian officials warning exhausted workers stuck there for almost three weeks has stopped making some safety repairs and they have russians looking over their shoulder is that a problem that's a huge problem if something kinetic happens, if fire breaks out like, like it happened last Thursday in, uh, night in uh, Zaporizhia, well, then you are in uncharted waters. Here in the Incident and Emergency Center, experts have been monitoring Ukraine's power plants 24-7 ever since the war started, taking in data from radiation sensors and speaking directly to officials on the ground. In a crisis, how soon can you get this up and running? We can fill the room with all of our experts within 60 minutes. How often are you in touch with your Ukrainian counterparts? At least three times a day. Uh, they're working under extremely difficult conditions. They're very courageous people, and so we don't want to stress them. The IAEA has been racing to reach a deal with Russia and Ukraine to allow in its own experts, the only ones qualified for the overwhelming task of keeping Ukraine's nuclear reactors safe and under watch in the middle of an un predictable war. But Grossi says time is running out. If there was a massive episode involving release of significant amounts of nuclear material, there could be radiation uh, moving on in the, in the European, into the European space. We have to prevent that from happening. We have the ability to do it. We have to do it now. And Josh Letterman joins me now from Vienna. Josh, I think everybody's thinking about worst case scenario. How big of a strike would it take to cause a dangerous nuclear accident? Well, the good news, Kate, according to Grossi, is that nuclear power plants are much safer now than they were in the 1980s when the Chernobyl accident took place. In fact, they're built to withstand a direct hit from an airplane. But a hit is not the only thing to be worried about here. Grossi says they're also concerned that fighting could damage power lines or pipelines that are needed to cool nuclear material. And if an incident was significant enough, it could lead to radiation leaks that could move beyond Ukraine and even spill across the border into other countries in Europe. Kate? Josh Letterman, thank you. Uh, we want to bring in Ambassador John Hurst. He's director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council and the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine under President George W. Bush. Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. Uh, what do you expect to come out of this NATO summit? And do you expect President Biden to maybe go one step further and, and go into Poland? Um. I don't rule out President Biden visiting uh, the Eastern European countries, our NATO allies, who are next to or very close to Russia. Uh, but what I expect to happen is I think there will be a clear decision on enhancing NATO's force posture in the East, because Putin's objectives go beyond conquering Ukraine, but establishing great, great influence, if not conquering the Baltic states, and perhaps in establishing greater influence throughout the eastern part of our alliance. He said that publicly before he went into Ukraine with this large invasion force three weeks ago. We also saw leaders today from Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovenia, meeting with the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, in Kyiv. Uh, what message are they trying to send there? And, and will Putin get any message from that? This was an example of both courage and solidarity. They were willing to take the risk of a strike by Russian bombers or a Russian rocket on their train as they traveled to Kyiv. And they also showed, I think, that possibly establishing a real humanitarian corridor not subject to Russian attacks is possible. 
The Ukrainian president expected to address the U.S. Congress tomorrow. Uh, he's very likely to ask for that no-fly zone again over Ukraine. It, it seems to be a non-starter. What, what can Congress do for Ukraine? Well, I think that right now a no-fly zone is not possible given the politics in Washington. But one thing that should be possible is, is setting far more uh, equipment, um, war equipment, to Ukraine. The administration keeps saying it's sending all of the stuff that Ukraine needs. That's nonsense. First of all, we're not sending enough stingers. We are sending stingers, but not enough. Secondly, we're not sending more advanced anti-aircraft missiles that could take out Russian bombers at 10,000 meters. Stingers only work effectively up to 3,000 meters. We should be sending more advanced weaponry to take out Russian rockets and planes. We also should be sending missiles that can be used against the Russian Navy, which is right now bombarding um, Odessa. If we had sent anti-ship anti rockets to Ukraine last fall, Moscow would have had far fewer gains in the south of Ukraine. It's vital that Ukraine keep Odessa, its last big port. We need to send those missiles to Ukraine. The administration should stop being timid and being intimidated by, by um, Putin's threats. Can I ask you, because you were ambassador to Ukraine, when you look at what's happening on the ground and then you hear the Russian explanations for what they're doing, they're, they're essentially telling their country that they're stopping hateful groups. H how do you make sense of that? It's very simple. The Russian people do not want Russian soldiers fighting Ukrainians. And they do not want Russian military bombing Ukrainian cities, attacking them with their tanks. Uh, they do not want Russia to use the tactics it used in Syria and in Chechnya, where it had massive bombardment designed to kill both soldiers and civilians. So the, Putin has only one option, to lie. And because he's been clacking down on the flow of real information into, Ukraine, into Russia, he might get away with it, at least in the short term. But something else the administration needs to do is use our substantial cyber capacity in conjunction with um, major tech firms in the United States to get real information into the Russian media space so the Russian people see the atrocities committed by Putin's military. Ambassador Hertz, thank you so much for being with us. Up next, we take you to a small city to the west of Kyiv that's come under constant and deadly bombardment by Russian forces. NBC's Matt Bradley is there. Like so many of Ukraine's cities, Zhitomyr's civilians are paying the price for Putin's war. No one died when this high school was destroyed, but the devastation remains. How does it feel coming back here, the memories? It's <laughs> No. Svetlana used to teach here. Her daughter went to school here. Is Vladimir Putin waging his war on children? It's a confused kind of anguish. No one here can figure out why the Russian army destroyed these places. This used to be a military barrack, so it could be considered a legitimate target, but all of this, civilian, just collateral damage. Terrorism was the word we kept hearing. This community is convinced Russia wants to sap their will. Tomorrow, there could be Russian soldiers in the streets. What will you do then? This massive triple bombing on a residential neighborhood cost Sergei Yehomovich his home and his daughter. She was pregnant when she died. Serhei dug her body out of the rubble with his bare hands. As we spoke, Serhei spotted his cat, who had been missing since the shelling. He had thought she was gone. Now she's among the few things he has left. Matt Bradley, NBC News, Zhitomyr, Ukraine. Even in the devastation of war, some bonds are never broken. One family is struggling to escape while their best friend tries desperately to help. Our Molly Hunter is in Ukraine with that emotional story. This would be their last duet for a while. Anton and Ala Bulak and three-year-old daughter Lisa are like millions of Ukrainian families facing the wrenching decision to leave or to stay. By the time we meet them in Lviv, they've already made the 350-mile journey from their home in Kyiv reluctantly. Finally, I said, hey, Anton, you need to get out of Kyiv. American Pete Yednak was traveling in Ukraine 13 years ago on vacation when he met Anton, 
They've been best friends ever since. Godfather to Lisa, Pete's been watching the war from Wisconsin. We were having these conversations every day, Anton says. He started screaming at me, you have to get out. If I be alone, don't leave. You better stay. Yes. But you have Allah and you have a daughter. Yeah. I'm waiting to uh, get to passport control. Last week, and, Pete flew uh, from Wisconsin all the way to Poland and then crossed and, uh, the border to talk to his friend in person. We will be to Lviv in about an hour. He's my best friend in the world. And, you know, I'm, I'm here in Ukraine despite everything going on because of that friendship. And he's a... Uh, a very loving husband and father and you know so devoted to his family so it's it's definitely going to be tough on him as a young man anton can't leave the country and allah doesn't want to go abroad by herself are you afraid no she afraid. she's afraid she's afraid she's afraid after our interview the family makes the decision Pete would accompany Allah and Lisa to Poland, then hopefully on to the U.S. We come back as they're packing up. Lisa knows she's going to say goodbye to her dad, but doesn't understand why. Are you nervous? Are we nervous? Anton walks them into the train station. Be safe. I will. And the heartache sets in. I will. Anton on the phone with his wife and daughter. Finally, the train departs. Anton gathers his things, one backpack, and the family cat. I hope I'll be all right. He has done all a father can. Molly Hunter, NBC News, Lviv, Ukraine. Molly Hunter, thank you for that report. Let's switch back to news here at home. Tonight, a 30-year-old man suspected of shooting five homeless men, killing two, is in custody. Police arresting him following a four-day manhunt spanning across multiple states. NBC's Garrett Hake has those details. Overnight, the arrest of a suspect wanted in connection with five shootings in New York City and Washington, D.C., two of them fatal, all targeting homeless men. Federal agents in Washington staking out, then surrounding a man D.C. police identified as 30-year-old Gerald Brevard III. I knew that if he was in D.C. with that image, he would be found. Police had been looking for a single suspect who shot three men sleeping on the streets of Washington earlier this month, killing one of them, then shooting two more in New York City last weekend, killing this man. Homelessness should not be a homicide. This was a cold-blooded attack. It was a D.C. police captain who first made the connection between the crimes. And as he was going through the social media in New York, uh, he took that back to his team who's working on this case. It was like, hey, look, this looks like our guy. On Monday night, officials released these photos taken from an ATM camera and asked the public for help identifying the suspect. Tips from both cities led detectives to track down Brevard. Just how critical were the tips for the, from the community in making this arrest? Well, it was extremely helpful. Uh, tips came in from all over, and again, that, that is what public safety, true public safety, looks like. Brevard has a lengthy criminal history. His father telling NBC News, like many across the world, his son suffers from mental illness. The system has failed regarding the treatment of so many, including my son. And Garrett Haig joins us now from Washington. Garrett, now that the suspect's in custody, what's next in this investigation? Well, Brevard could be arraigned in Washington as early as tonight. He's been charged in those three cases. But New York police still want to see more evidence before they charge him in the New York City cases. That could come in the form of recovering the weapon. That's now one of the top priorities for investigators here in D.C. They think the same gun was used in all five shootings. They want to try to find it here in the district. Kate. All right, Garrett, thank you. And another update from here in New York City. Police have now arrested the suspect in that stabbing at the Museum of Modern Art. 60-year-old Gary Cabana was taken into custody in Philadelphia this morning. Police say he is the man caught on camera there jumping over the reception desk this weekend and stabbing two museum employees. Police say he recently had his museum membership revoked. Now to Chicago, where late this afternoon, the top prosecutor in the county announced no charges for the police officers in involved in two high-profile deadly shootings last year. That includes the shooting of 13-year-old Adam Toledo, which sparked protests across the country. NBC's Jesse Kirsch has the details. Please stop! Stop right now! Tonight, nearly a year after Chicago police shot and killed 13-year-old Adam Toledo and 22-year-old Anthony Alvarez, prosecutors announcing the officers who fired their guns in both incidents will face no criminal charges. This is a somber announcement. 
as there are no winners in this very tragic situation. In March 2021, prosecutors say Chicago police officer Eric Stillman was responding to a call of shots fired. That's when he came across Adam Toledo, chased the seventh grader down an alley, and fired one fatal shot. The child's death prompting protests after police body cam footage was released. The video shows what authorities say was a gun in Toledo's hand. Surveillance video appears to show the teen tossing something before turning toward the officer. Cook County State's attorney Kim Fox says Toledo dropped a gun and raised his hand in less than a second. Officer Stillman reacted to the perceived threat presented by Adam Toledo, who he believed at the time was turning toward him to shoot him. Based on the facts, the evidence, and the law, We've concluded that there was no evidence to prove that Officer Stillman acted with criminal intent. Similarly, Fox's office determined Officer Evan Solano's use of deadly force was reasonable during a separate foot pursuit when he shot and killed Anthony Alvarez, who she says, like Toledo, was armed with a gun. While the evidence is insufficient to support criminal charges, it is important to highlight that the officers themselves created the conditions which the use of deadly force became necessary. Chicago police facing public pressure after the deadly shootings just two days apart made changes to the department foot pursuit policy. Seattle's former police chief says the lack of criminal charges doesn't mean the old foot pursuit rules were perfect. If in fact policies were changed, that's a good thing. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a criminal violation, uh, but it does mean that the department is looking at making things safer and how they, they can come back uh, and learn something from these incidents. Tonight, Alvarez's family writing they are saddened and disappointed, saying his shooting death was unjustified and calling for accountability. And in a separate statement, the Toledo family also expressing disappointment, saying in part, Officer Stillman's use of deadly force was excessive and posed a threat to the safety of Adam and others. We will be contacting the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division to address this horrific travesty. And Jesse Kirsch is with me now. Jesse, we just heard that statement that they're going to be in contact. What's next for the family of Adam Toledo? Yeah, the Toledo family is calling for peace in the streets of Chicago. They're focused on a lawsuit against the city as well as the officer who shot and killed Adam Toledo. Loved ones of Anthony Alvarez are also suing the city as well as two officers involved with the incident that led to that man's shooting death. The officers, were told, according to Chicago police, are still with the department. The officer who shot and killed Anthony Alvarez, we're told, has been relieved of police powers but is still a member of the department. Meanwhile, the the officer who shot and killed Adam Toledo, we're told, is still active on the Chicago Police Department's force. We've reached out to attorneys for both of those officers, but have not heard back yet, Kate. All right, Jesse, thank you so much. Now to the weather and severe storms slamming the south. At least one tornado slicing through North Texas last night, leaving behind a trail of damage. The twister tearing apart homes and buildings, uprooting trees, leaving hundreds without power. Luckily, no injuries were reported there. NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins me now for more on the forecast. I see a lot of green on that map, Michelle. Yeah, hi there, Kate. It's that time of year where we're starting a new season. We're seeing those clash of air masses, and that's what we're seeing tonight, severe weather in the southeast. So as we look at radar, we're looking at storms. We're hearing thunder. We're looking at lightning stretching from Florida all the way to Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, into Arkansas, and also Louisiana. And this threat will be with us over the next several days. So for tonight, we're watching the threat for severe weather. Winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Could see some hail as well. Isolated tornadoes from Melbourne to Daytona Beach, Tampa and also Fort Myers. That's where you see the yellow on the map. So as we go throughout time here tomorrow, that area of low pressure is going to move off to the north and east. It's going to bring rain and storms stretching from Florida to Virginia with local downpours, also some flooding rains. And then as we head towards Thursday, it's going to be soggy in the mid-Atlantic, also the northeast through New England. We're going to see that area of low pressure really pick up speed and bring rain. So the heaviest rain in parts of the mid-Atlantic to the southeast, so Charlotte, Columbia, Charleston, where you see the yellows and oranges, that's where we're expecting the heaviest rains, and we could see up to two inches in some spots. 
As we head off to the west, we're looking at snow. So that's the other side of the storm. We're looking at some really cold weather in the Rockies. So we're looking at snow in the highest elevations up to a foot in some spots. We're looking anywhere generally from three up to a foot in some spots. Where you see the pinks and the purples, that is your heaviest snow. And this area of low pressure is going to slide off to the south and east through the plains. And then we're going to see stormy weather uh, affecting parts of the plains as we head towards Wednesday. Kate? Okay, Michelle, we kind of gave it away because we just put that graphic up. But while I've got you, <laughs> I have to ask you about this. So today the Senate passes a bill to make daylight yeah. saving time permanent, meaning I guess mm -hmm. we wouldn't change our clocks anymore. We'd stay on the same time all year. I'm having a hard yeah. time processing this. I know we all grumble when we I lose know. an hour when, in the spring when we go forward. But, but what's the upside and downside? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think we all have our personal opinion about this. So what this bill says is we're going to keep daylight saving time in place. So what we're experiencing right now, those later sunset, that's going to be year round. So there's data, Kate, as we, you know, make those switches. We like consistency. So we see a spike in heart attacks. We see a spike in accidents. We see a spike in car accidents as well. So let's talk about data in terms of the cons, because when you think of later sunrises, we're talking some spots not seeing a sunrise until 948 a.m. And that's in North wow. Dakota. And even in the Northeast, we may not see a sunrise until 818, 820, 825. So think of the kids going to store, uh, going to school in these uh, late, you know, those dark mornings. And then pros real quick, lots of sunshine, better health, outdoors, the kids are outdoors. Uh, so sunshine does equal a better quality of life in terms of your health. Back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with a horrific attack outside of New York City. We want to warn you, some of what you're about to see is disturbing. Security footage capturing the suspect punching a 67-year-old woman more than 125 times, stomping and spitting on her as well. It came after police in Yonkers, New York, say he yelled a racist slur at her outside a building. Officials now charging that man with attempted murder as a hate crime. A skier in Utah was nearly swept away by an avalanche, a GoPro camera capturing the moment a wall of snow began cascading down Provo Canyon, briefly burying the skier. He says he managed to get out of the slide's path and dug his hands into the snow to try to hold on. The man, who's been skiing for more than 25 years, says he and his friends took every precaution to prevent that kind of situation. And the family of comedian Bob Saget winning a court battle to keep his records, records about his death, rather, under seal. A Florida judge agreeing to permanently block some images and records surrounding the actor's death from public release. His family requested the injunction, citing privacy concerns. A publicly released autopsy showed Saget died of head trauma, which was likely caused by a fall in his Orlando hotel room back in January. Now to an update on the fight against COVID-19. Tonight, Pfizer asking the FDA to authorize a fourth COVID vaccine shot for Americans 65 and older. The request coming amid growing concerns that a wave of new infections overseas could mean the U.S. might be headed for another COVID spike. Miguel Almaguer has the details. Seeking emergency use authorization, tonight NBC News confirms Pfizer has submitted new data to the FDA, hoping to greenlight a second COVID booster shot for Americans 65 and older. Citing waning immunity several months after a third dose, the company's CEO says a fourth shot would dramatically improve protection against infection. Are Americans really going to be willing to get a second booster or a fourth shot? I think we've seen problems with people getting their first boosters. I mean, we only have 50% of eligible people boosted right now, and that's, that's already a big problem. Pfizer's push comes as COVID cases spike in pockets of the globe. Cases in mainland China up 377%. In the UK, infections have surged over 52%. Dr. Fauci attributes three major factors behind England's rise. Omicron subvariant BA2 is more transmissible, though not necessarily more severe. Relaxed mandates like no longer masking indoors also having an impact, as is waning immunity from vaccination or prior infection. And Miguel Almaguer is with me now from Los Angeles. So Miguel, how's the White House preparing for this possibility that maybe we could see another surge? 
Well, Kate, the White House says it needs more money, more COVID funding, not only to get more vaccines out on the market and educate the public, but also for research, including what we talked about, those waste water plants. They said if they can detect early cases of COVID, they'll know to be able to warn the public to be better prepared for the next surge. Kate. Inflation continuing to impact Americans every day with the Federal Reserve expected to raise interest rates this week. As many forecasters say, there's a growing chance of a recession due to this move. According to the latest CNBC Fed survey of fund managers, strategists and economists, there is a 33 percent chance by their estimation of a recession in the United States, an increase over the last survey and a 50 percent chance of a recession in Europe, they say. Let's bring in CNBC senior economics reporter Steve Leisman. Steve, good to see you. Inflation such a big problem. We are all noticing it, right? Gas prices in particular. But people are still out there spending money. They're traveling. They're eating out. Every month, the unemployment rate drops. So what is driving this pessimism that we just mentioned in the forecast? It is pretty crazy right now, right? I mean, you have this recovery going on from the Omicron and the COVID shutdown that we had as kind of things return to normal, uh, and you have spending around that. You have people that appear to have an awful lot of money in their pockets, and they have uh, the low unemployment rate. We've been creating about a half a million jobs a month. But when it comes to asking people about the economy, the thing that is the most transcendent is the inflation rate that they are very concerned about uh, their standard of living going down. And really what I think has driven the increase uh, in the chance of recession uh, by the forecasters is this supply shock and this price shock that we're getting from the uh, uh, Ukraine and the Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine, uh, because I think we had high inflation already. And now you're going to pile additional price increases on top of that. And I think the concern is that this consumer that has been such a stalwart all along here uh, may finally feel the stresses of yeah. higher prices and begin to reduce that spending. And some also wonder if it's the Federal Reserve ending the era of cheap money. You can't borrow it as, as you know, easily as you could. Is that part of the equation, too? I think that's a part of it, but I would point out that money is really, really cheap right now. And so after the Fed gets done over the next several months raising rates, it's only going to be really cheap. Um, <laughs> and by that, I mean the Fed is going to raise rates, at least at the moment, relatively slowly, a quarter of a percentage point tomorrow, a quarter in six weeks, a quarter after that. The expectation is that by the end of the year, our zero rate, or really it's 0.08, if you really want to be technical about it, will be about 1.4 percentage points by the end of the year. That's the estimate of the forecasters in our survey here. Now, that's a lot higher than it was now. But guess what? We went into the pandemic. It was 1.75 percent. So if this is a normal functioning economy, we can certainly stomach higher interest rates and interest rates that do a better job of keeping a hold on inflation. Steve, real quick, it's worth pointing out that uh, among the forecasters who you asked, most did, did not believe there will be a recession, just that it is possible that there will be. Um, are, are these temporary things we're going through in Ukraine and the oil prices? What, what role do you think all that is playing? So uh, you, you immediately qualify for a financial journalism degree by making no. that point. That is no. absolutely correct. <laughs> um, it, <laughs> yes, you do. You're good. You're good to go. Because what happens is we ask our forecasters, what is the probability of a recession? And it comes back at 33%. Any given month without a big war like this going on, it's one in four or one in five. Now it's raised to one in three. It is higher, but you are 100 percent correct. It is not the forecast right now of the average economist. They're looking for 2.8 percent GDP growth. That's down from what it was, but they still believe the economy. Most still believe the economy is going to grow. Look, we have a big shock coming into this economy from what's happened in Ukraine. Uh, we, we, we longer term have a bunch of changes. Challenges. We're going to start probably spending a whole lot more money on defense. We may not go for the most efficient supply chain anymore because it may be we want some stuff here at home. We may have a more secure supply chain. That may mean higher prices overall. So there's the short term shock and some long term transitions that are about to come to this economy. So I think that's why there's concern about the outlook overall.
All right, CNBC's Steve Leisman, always good to have you. Thanks so much. Coming up, the rescue effort underway after a massive landslide in Peru. The stunning collapse caught on camera. Residents now rushing to dig out their neighbors trapped under the mud and going through walls. We'll be right back. Back now with Top Stories Global Watch, and we begin with a deadly explosion in a popular Mexican beach town. The explosion leveling part of a resort restaurant in Playa del Carmen. Two people killed, another 18 injured. Authorities believe a gas tank inside a kitchen caused that blast. Rescue operations are underway after a major landslide in Peru. Shocking new video showing the moment a hillside gives way. Look at that. A wall of mud, trees and rocks taking out dozens of homes. Residents trying to break down a wall to pull out their trapped neighbors to safety. Some rescue crews are now on the scene, but that area is deep in the Andes Mountains. Hard to get to. Dozens of people are feared dead. And the Eiffel Tower is now about 20 feet taller. A helicopter attaching a new digital radio antenna to the top of the iconic Paris Monument today. The tower, built in the late 19th century, now measures 1,082 feet. It is one of the most visited tourist sites in the world. Probably don't have to tell you that. It has been used for broadcast transmissions for more than a century. Who knew that? Uh, when we come back, birthday wish, the call that one daughter made for her mom's 90th birthday and the hundreds and hundreds of people who answered. Well, finally tonight, when it comes to birthdays, you know, we all hope to celebrate with well wishes from friends, maybe a birthday card or two. But for one woman's 90th birthday, the birthday cards have filled her mailbox and then some. Last month, Jerry Klepish from Wisconsin turned 90 years old. The well wishes started normally enough with a card from her daughter. This is from my daughter, Aline, and she wrote in here, my words are simple, but true and straight from my heart. But Jerry's friends had other plans, asking friends and family to send Jerry cards, hoping to reach 90 cards for Jerry's 90th birthday. I mean, who doesn't love to get a birthday card in the mail? But their call for cards went viral. I didn't hear about it until I had about 25, 30 cards. She says, you're going to get a lot more. <laughs> and those cards just kept arriving in Jerry's mailbox. Alaska, Idaho, Montana. Michigan, Illinois, Iowa, lots from Iowa and Colorado, Nebraska. The call for cards was answered by strangers across the country, 232 of them sending letters. Well, you got a whole nother stack here, don't you? All helping to wish Jerry a happy birthday. And most of those people I don't know. Rest assured, Jerry enjoyed every single one of those cards. I bet you'd like to see this guy with just a pair of tiny boxers singing happy birthday. <laughs> Precious, aren't they? <laughs> I will never forget it. And when I take them down, I'll read them all again and put them in a box and save them. <laughs> now surrounded by a lifetime supply of birthday cards, Jerry says the most important card remains the one from her daughter. My prayer is that you always remember my love for you and that you can feel it when I'm not there. <laughs> she always makes me cry. Oh, Jerry, you made us cry and you made us laugh. We want to wish Jerry a very, very happy birthday. We want to thank our affiliate in Eau Claire, WEAU, for their help with that story. Thank you so much for watching Top Story. For Tom Yamas, I'm Kate Snow in New York. Stay right there. More news now on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.